I got into the Army by default. I got into the Army because I wanted a place to play hockey. That would have been in uh, June of uh, 1939, and by September we were at war. So then the colonel called me in and said, uh, we want you to join the regiment as an officer. And I said, no. He said, what? I said, no, thanks. I said, I'll, I'll join all right, but uh, this war is going to be over by Christmas. And uh, besides, I, what qualification do I have to, to lead men? I found out a little bit later that um, uh, probably I did. I was very interested in sports. I was interested in history. I was interested in military things because my father had been wounded in World War I. I would say also that I really grew up b believing in Canada. My mother was very conscious of being a Canadian. I lived in a neighborhood in Fort Rouge, Winnipeg, where there were a lot of veterans and the Legion was big and whatnot. And these guys would sit around and talk about their experiences, but my father's view was more, um, uh, I served my country, I know my life has been shortened by it, so I better make the best of what I have left. And uh, he sternly believed in that, and he drove it into my sister and myself. On Sundays, his buddies would all gather at our house, and they'd take a bung out of a keg of beer and, and uh, shoot the breeze. And my mother would hush me off to play ball or something. She'd say, you don't need this sort of stuff. <laughs> but uh, I, I knew that they were talking war. But um, again, I never noticed them saying, well, Charlie Jopling was a great hero because he took a pillbox or something. They never talked about that. They more talked about the fact that uh, in the next war, Charlie Jopling was going to have a traveling brothel, I mean, come back a millionaire. I remember that very much. And these were the kind of stories that these guys would tell, but they never got serious about the war. And uh, I, I guess when I joined this, the, the Army, I really joined the Royal Winnipeg Rifles as a hockey player. I didn't join as a military guy at all. I was on the farm team of New York Rangers, and um, that's really why I got into the Army. When I was in high school, I got interested in debating. Some people say I've never lost that interest, but <laughs> when Time Magazine came into our house, that was mine. I read it from cover to cover. My dad just said, look, uh, you have to make sure that you get your education, and it was a great spur to me to uh, play a little hockey, but uh, don't forget your, your homework, and don't forget your studies, and uh, that type of thing. And, you're heading for university no matter what. And I had that dropped into me when I was 10 years old. I can remember writing uh, letters to the editor when I was maybe 14, 15 years of age and getting a couple of them published. <laughs> so uh, then when I, uh, when I was going to university, I worked part-time for the Canadian press. I used to take all the news from the wire from Toronto and the wire from Edmonton condense it for the Brandon Sun. 
While everybody else was saying, you know, what does this mean? I was converting it to print. I mean, you know what? And I said to myself, what am I writing here? I mean, you know, I mean, this, this is Armageddon. This is, this is war, and uh, you, you're not going to fool around with us. I mean, this, this means that lives are going to be on the line, and, uh, and that's the, probably the first time I really took a look at my father as a hero. I said to my father, you know, uh, Dad, uh, you've suffered to be hell in your life from being gassed at Vimy Ridge and uh, for a principle. And the principle was you don't want to live under a dictator like Kaiser Wilhelm. And uh, he said, well, there's not uh, a lot I could do about it. He said, there's not a lot you're going to be able to do about it either, but go and do your best. And my mother wasn't a conscientious objector at all about the war. And she knew a lot about Hitler and and uh, the the, uh, the danger to our way of life from dictators and whatnot. And she knew all of those things, and she had a very subtle way of putting them across to me. So she sort of said, now you're in, go. I don't expect you to hide and do your job, but be careful. Never make a move unless you have to. And if you have to, then make it and do your damnedest. Put a fellow in a, in a Royal Winnipeg rifle uniform with the black buttons, tell him to go to a dance hall in Winnipeg just as the war was heating up. And all of a sudden, he was transformed from an ordinary guy to something very special. It's very hard to explain that, but he felt very special because he was a soldier in a very famous regiment. It was an experience uh, to, to join the Army and, and to really, if you like, I hate to use the word, but to study it, to understand that you had a God-given opportunity to understand what men were, what life was all about, what men were all about, what men were capable of. Our first experience, of course, was um, parade ground. And if you get a bunch of what we call clodhoppers, you get a bunch of guys who've been out stooking wheat or running a trap line or something and say, you know, uh, stand to your front and right turn and uh, at the incline, quick march. And they'd say, what the hell is this all about? I joined the army to fight Germans, you see. But you, you'd have to explain to them that the British Army had learned that if you didn't know your field drill, if you didn't know how to start and stop and turn right and turn left, you were just a jumble out there. And so um, we had some unusual sort of uh, ways of teaching it. I always loved that part of it, part of soldiering for some reason or other. Nobody ever thought that it would be four years before we were in action. I mean, quite the contrary. We said, you know, you've got to get ready. The war was not going well in England, and uh, the first division was already over there. The second division was on its way over, and uh, we were told as the third division, I mean, we would be needed very shortly. What was my reaction to all of this was, um, the camaraderie got a hold of me. Everybody was put to the same level. You were eating the same, you were drinking the same, you were chasing girls, if you like, the same. I began to realize that if you were with a bunch of guys who had all been prepared to put their life on the line, they were good guys. If they weren't, they got out. I certainly found out I was willing to take a commission simply because most of the guys were just really solid guys, good characters, rough, tough. And um, we had a lot of Métis served with us. The Métis were just superb soldiers. Uh, the infantryman that, that I served with is, boy, uh, those guys were great. June the 
6, 1944. The Canadian invasion forces had spent years in Britain training for the task. They had tried very hard not to think of what lay ahead. This is their remarkable story, how they formed the assault wave that smashed through the German defenses, held off the counterattacks of the crack SS Panzer units, and how, in the end, they took, in a magnificent battle, the pivotal city of Caen. It took a month. It was difficult to realize the enormity of what we would be attempting. I was part of that force. Untried troops would dare to set foot in Hitler's Europe. I've earned a living at sort of trying to portray how horrible war is, and if you're not prepared to talk about it, you might as well go home and grow wheat or, or find a courtroom and practice law or whatever you want to do. Very, very noisy. The smell of cordite was very powerful. To get poetic about it, it was the moment of truth. I mean, you know, when you see a guy standing beside you one minute, and the next minute you see his head blown off or his arm flying through the air, uh, or he, he lets off an awful... And when a guy gets hit by a shell, it makes a hell of a noise, you know. People say, oh, it's, it's soft tissue. He goes, Jeez, I'll never forget it. Just makes me shiver when I think of it right now. A guy getting hit point blank by a mortar shell. Jesus, it's just awful. And I hate to say it, but it's it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Get on with your goddamn job or you're gonna you're gonna be next type of thing. The assault troops were highly, highly trained that if Bill McWilliams was shot and he fell beside you and you stopped to, to get him, help him. What about your objective? Because the same shell that got him is going to get three, four other guys. In that first 10 or 15 minutes of the landing, what you learned is instinctively you knew that Bill McWilliams wasn't going to make it or you knew that it was a fatal shot, or, praise God, you knew that you could drag him ashore, and that did happen in some cases. You could drag the guy ashore, and he'd have a, a fighting chance to, to get out of this war. You have an inherent feeling that I can get out of it. No matter what it is, I can get out of it. My job was to land and take the carriers and go left along the beach. And uh, that's kind of a dangerous vehicle to be driving around in because there's no top to it, you see, and it's, it's only uh, three-eighths of an inch of, of uh, cast iron. That's the first time I sort of said to myself, what do you mean, Cliff, that you can get out of it? I mean, how the hell are you going to get out if a bomb lands right in the middle of this damn vehicle of yours, you see? And then I said, well, I mean, th that kind of thinking is not going to get you anywhere, so think of something else. And you, you, you kid yourself. I think you really kid yourself. The carrier is the eyes and ears of the regiment. My job was to keep in touch with the colonel and tell him what you saw. So I turned left and I said uh, to the driver, I said, Sparky, let's go. Just follow the, the beach right along. And uh, he stopped and he said, uh, what's the matter? He said, I don't run over that body. And I said, yes, you are. He said, no, I'm not. So he said, you get out and drag the god darn body out of the way, and I'll take the carrier where it's supposed to go. Well, that's the first time I ever touched a dead body. And it, it, I grabbed this guy by the ankles, and I didn't look at him. I don't know today whether he was German or Canadian. I have no idea. But the next guy, I knew. I knew him very well. And I took a look at him, and I thought, that's it. That's it, I'll take a look at his gaiters, I'll take a look at his combat boots, I don't know he's a Winnipeg rifle, and that's all. Just drag him out of the way and go, because if you get dwelling on the fact that 
that that that that this guy is is, is Garth Henderson and and he's not going to be with you anymore and you're not going to see him drink a beer or dance in a dance hall or what you know if you start thinking that i mean it it's just going to destroy you. you're not going to have the will to go our objective for d day was a place called puto en besson which was about 10 miles inland we expected we were told that the landing would be light that once we got in there, we could go like mad and go right through to this railway crossing at a place called Brue, which was the western end of this Puto. A Company, Able Company of the Winnipeg Rifles were ahead of us uh, walking. It had probably taken me 25 to 30 minutes to get organized and get all my troops and do everything I had to do according to the battle order. Then we followed uh, A Company down this road. I came to the top of the ridge, and there was the left side of the British 50th Division, the Inns of Court, and so I was in liaison with this officer. We were sitting talking, and I was afraid to get undercover because this officer had been in a lot of action, this guy from the Inns of Court, and I thought, well, I'm a rough, tough Canadian. I'm not gonna jump out of a hole here, you see. But he didn't, nothing seemed to bother this guy, but he was that type. He was leaning against the fender of the scout car, talking away, and all at once he looked up with his, again, his cigarette still going in his holder, and he said, honest to God, he said, I say, old boy, I think they're coming. <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was in the carrier, and my driver was in before me. <laughs> and uh, then we looked up, and you can see the Germans coming across. And they had already captured Ab Able Company, and they were coming through this way. And I got on the set, and I told the colonel that they were coming down this road. Then they turned, and they went in, and they captured a bunch of our troops that were in this town of Puto. From then, it was fluid warfare. They were coming over. They were dropping shells on us. We were dropping shells on them. And uh, that's when we heard the terrible news that they had shot our people in the field. And uh, uh, that's, uh, we didn't have that confirmed for about a month. That was tough to hear that. Boy. Now we were about eight miles west of the uh, Abbey Dardenne at the Chateau Dodrio. And that was the headquarters of a guy by the name of Monkey, was his name, real miserable SS. And he was the guy who took our troops into a field and shot them. This monument was erected in 1989 to the loving memory of 58 members of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. Also, eight soldiers from other regiments and units who were murdered in the grounds of the Chateau Dodrio at fontenay le Penel at Haute de Bosque and other surrounding areas. This monument is mute testimony to the brutal murders carried out under the direction of Nazi General Wilhelm Monke. The young men were defenseless Canadian volunteers. Other war crimes had been carried out the day before at the famous Abbe d'Ardenne by another SS general, Kurt Meyer. The prisoners involved came mostly from the North Nova Scotia Highlanders and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers. You, you thought that you could get killed in a war, but you never thought that you could get lined up against a fence and, and they just mow you down. I mean, I, I, I think I can say that with all honesty. I don't know one soldier who would say that he looked upon that as a possible end. The ordinary German troop soldier wasn't a bad guy. I mean, he fought a clean war as much as you could expect. But the German SS, just brutal murders. I mean, they just didn't believe in the Geneva Convention, and they were all 26 years of age or younger, and thorough, thorough, thorough Nazis. Our colonel was very smart. Tell your guys, don't retaliate. If you retaliate, you're only asking for more. 
We took on an awful lot of prisoners. I don't know in the hundreds, I've never heard, but if we had got the reputation of shooting prisoners, those guys would never have given up. They would have fought to the last man, the last bullet, and we would have lost a lot of people we didn't have to lose. The worst day I ever spent was when the colonel told me to go into this field and pick up all the Winnipeg rifles I could find, dead or alive. And I thought, he's kidding. But when I got out there and I realized that a lot of them were dead and then some of them were alive and they had been out there two days and they had been crying, mama, whoo, boy. And, and uh, I said, okay, on with the job. I don't care who they are. I just take a look at their boots. I know they're Winnipeg rifles. See, we had combat boots where ordinary soldiers didn't. We had mercury helmets, which ordinary, only the D-Day troops had or, the mercury helmets. So, uh, no, I, uh, I just said, you, you can't identify with these people. Now, the time to identify is if he's in your company and you have to sit down and write his wife a letter or his loved one a letter, then that's, but that all is, comes afterwards. What was it like to write a letter to a mother? People often said one of the worst jobs as a, for an officer was to write the next of kin and say, you know, we've just buried your son or something. Well, you were programmed to write those kind of letters. Otherwise, you never could have written them. How could you write a letter, you know, to a guy when you, you used to take his sister out dancing or something like that? You stuck to the form, as the Brits would say. You see, it didn't happen to private soldiers. They never wrote letters. It didn't happen to corporals. It just happened to officers. Who was the officers or the senior NCOs who were acting as officers? It just happened to them. They were the only ones who went through this experience. And I think that they learned that uh, if they were to bear their souls, if they were really to try to say what this really meant, I mean, for uh, to see a guy, and uh, particularly if he was badly wounded, and uh, you know, you uh, let, let's get honest about it. Uh, supposing he had his head shot off, what do you do? Do you write his? You don't write his wife and say that, but you don't even admit it yourself. You just say, "Jim, old guy, Jesus, what a goddamn bloody mistake this was. And it's too bad, and I know I wish it had been somebody else, but uh, what you're really saying is, thank God it wasn't me." I'd read the papers every day And I'm really sad to say I see our memories turning gray And our heroes slipping away I was fortunate, I was in action longer than most commanders. And so, you know, I, through experience, I wasn't a great commander, but through experience, I'd learned the tricks of the trade. The first thing you did, and I think the Canadian Army was noted for this, is you tried to make sure that every man knew exactly what he was supposed to do and what we were supposed to be doing. I was even foolish enough to use words like, Look, we're not smarter than they are, but we're as smart as they are. And they've got a defensive position, so they got one up on us. So what we have to do is we have to lay on a fire plan that's gonna put smoke in front of their tanks when their tanks won't be able to see us. And, and you know, you'd lay it all out in a plan. That's the first thing you did. 
You never place a man in a position where he's going to give up his life unless you give him a chance to say, that's not the way I would do it. I can remember the plan that I laid on to take Calais, and my company was the lead company. And I turned to all the NCOs and I said, now, is that okay with you guys? And some of them would joke and say, yeah, I got an idea, sir. And say, What's that? Let's go the other way. And everybody would laugh like hell, you see? You know, that, but I love those kind of guys. Secondly, you have an evacuation plan for the wounded, how you're going to get them out. Now, you, you've heard the old story, we never surrender. That is pure BS. I mean, if I said to my troops before a tough attack, come on, guys, we will never surrender. They'd, they'd take a look at you and they'd say, you're some goddamn, come on, you out for a VC? I mean, they, they smelled a rat right off the bat. So you didn't ever say, if you were a good commander, you didn't say, we'll never surrender. What you said is, if things get really bad, I'll get you the hell out of there. One way or another, I'm gonna get you out. What else can you do? I never tried to fool my guys because how could they have any respect for you the next time you say to them, look, we're going to take this fort. This is going to be a piece of cake. Somebody says, yeah, that's what you said last time. You know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but don't ever try to fool a private soldier whose life is on the line. Ah, he got too much at stake. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, what you do is you say, I did my best. I lost more men than I should have. But if the plan had not been as good as it was, we may have lost through another 25. If uh, Major Plunkville was running the show, he'd have lost 27. Better to lose 17 under Chatterton than 27 under a guy who doesn't know his ass from first base. I've said that. I've said that. And. Uh, you know, it's probably the reason why I can sit here in this office and still have active correspondence with at least 20 of my men. I still write to them. They still write to me. The battle for Soulangy I had been sent down as a second in command of an infantry company. I'd been given the job to do what's called a recce or a reconnaissance of this Soulangy place. I took my regimental sergeant major with me and my batman runner. And uh, as we went into this farmyard, I saw all these soldiers lying there and they were all dead. And they are from the regiment that I showed the air, they, they were all killed. So um, I went past them and I went up to the sort of the lookout for this great big Soulangy castle, you call it. And there was a private soldier up there uh, who said, uh, where are the rest of the guys? I said, well, what are we doing here? And he said, we have to take this objective. And I said, well, where are the Germans? He said, I don't know. He said, how long have you been here? He said, oh, half an hour. I said, you seen any? He said, no. So I went back, hell bent for election, and took a motorcycle that was lying beside the road and drove back, and I told the CEO, they've left. And that was uh, where they were withdrawing, the Germans were withdrawing to Falaise. What do you plan to do? I said, well, let's take it before they uh, reoccupy the place. And he said, OK, uh, uh, how many men have you got? I said, about 60. And he said, can you take it? I said, there's nobody there. Sure, we can take it. He said, OK, off you go. So we got some trucks and put them into the trucks, drove within a quarter of a mile of this bloody big Soulangy. And I said, all right, now uh, we'll, we'll send uh, 17 platoon. We'll go around to the left. and." 16 platoon will go around to the right, and 15 platoon will come up this road. As soon as you hear any fire, hit the ground. And then we'll decide what we do, because we have to make a decision on the spot. OK, sir, fine, let's do it, bingo. And this is all taking place within 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most. 
So I'm, I'm walking down this road with the platoon that was in the center, and I hear brrrr, and you could always tell the, the German uh, uh, machine guns uh, had a faster rate of fire than ours, so I knew we were being fired on by Germans, so I said, go to ground. I saw this Jim Bullock come through, and he was holding his arm. And I said, what happened, Jim? He said, we got fired on. I said, how many men did you lose? He said, we lost them all. I said, Jesus, how could that? There was no, there was supposed to be no Germans there. So I said, OK, get back to the RAP. In the meantime, I'll get back to the colonel. So I tried to get the colonel. I couldn't get him. I finally got him, and he said, you've got to take the objective anyway. This was about half an hour later. I said, OK. So I had sent a guy by the name of Morris Sorno up on the right. He was a, a lieutenant. Jim Bullock had gone on the left. So I got on the set, and I said to Morris, I said, are you OK? And he said, yeah. And I said, uh, I'm going to, Jimmy, pa Jimmy Bullock has been uh, hurt. I'm going to send Doug Kirkpatrick up to relieve him. And then you're going to put on an attack on this final objective. And Sorno said, OK, that's fine. Within about five minutes of this conversation, I see this German tank come up through the bushes, blasting away, blasting away. And all I heard somebody say is they got Lieutenant Sorno. And then, oh my God. So then I got a hold of Kirkpatrick. And he was under fire and he was killed. Sorno was killed. Jimmy Bullock was wounded. That was my plan. That was the worst battle I was ever in, by far, because I, I don't blame myself as making a mistake. It was just that the ground was such that Germans could hide in it. They had fooled the Chaudière completely about it. So uh, I thought, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're safe to, to... If the Germans vacate someplace, you take it quickly, because if you don't, they're liable to come back. So I said, let's take it. So that was my worst uh, battle, battle action. Sixty years later, well, um, let me start with the cemeteries. When I go to a cemetery, I look up certain people. I can't look them all up. But for some reason or other, this battle is the same in my mind as if it happened yesterday. As a result, I go right to Doug Kirkpatrick's grave and I put a poppy on it. I go right to Morris Sorno's grave and I put a poppy on it. Then I, I often go back because it's on the main road between Caen and um, Falaise. I often go back to this farmhouse that's still there and stand there and just say, let the images hit me. Sometimes I close my eyes, sometimes I don't, but I, I just feel a physical presence of what happened there, of, of Sorno, Sorno's two IC saying to me, uh, Mr. Sorno got hit. Uh, of Doug Kirkpatrick's sergeant saying to me, we've carried Doug into the barn, he's dead. Um, of Jimmy uh, Bullock coming out of the bushes, holding onto his arm with blood streaming down. I even went and walked the walk uh, where the Germans were. I walked back to where the Germans were looking at us and uh, some guys that were on this, one of these pilgrimages with me, I said, I know what you're gonna laugh at me, but I want you to stand here and, and I'll tell you when you can move and you stand here and you stand. And I, I saw the ground from the point of view of the German 
Now, mind you, the bush has changed in 60 years, and this was about 40 years ago that I did this, but I, I, it helped me because I began to realize that nobody could have known the German position. It was superb. It was a superb defensive position. But how was I to know that? I wasn't, I, I didn't, but, but I could see it from their position. And uh, I said to myself, as an attacking Canadian infantry company commander, what could I have done differently? Nothing. In my company, we had a youngster who could sing like a bird. We used to call him Bing. And as we lay here very tense with the Germans on the other side of the canal, the order was given quietness. Then after a period of an hour or so, people began to talk and the Germans on the other side of the canal began to yell at us. And so somebody said, Bing, sing our song. We had a little song in our regiment. It went something like this. Put me in your pocket so that I'll be close to you. How could I ever forget it? He sang the song. And from across the canal, the Germans started to applaud. And then some German yelled in English, sing again, sing again. So Bing sang it again, and the German threw a grenade over the canal, and they killed him. I want to tell that story, though, for another reason. At the Leopold Canal, this was the first time that we used flamethrowers. And from the point of view of the infantry, we did not like the idea because it's the worst possible weapon of war for those who have to fight in the ground. And we knew that if we burned the Germans on the other side of this canal, they were going to be looking for revenge. This had bothered us all afternoon, but in my company at least, after they killed Bing with a grenade, we didn't have any compunction at all. I wanted to hunch down low on this dike to provide some idea of the perspective of what happened here on the night of October the 5th, 1944. At 0400 in the morning, the North Shore Regiment grabbed their KPOC assault boats and went up over this canal. We followed them. About this time, the flamethrowers were shooting streams of liquid fire across the canal. We could hear the Germans screaming, some of them, a light like torches were running up and down among those trees. The North Shore carried the KPOC boats down to the edge of the canal here. And eased them into the water. And as we got into the boats on the canal, the German positions, which had not come under fire, were opening with what we call enfilade fire at the boats. Approximately one half of the people who had gotten into the boats 
made it to the far side. So we lost a lot of men crossing that canal. How many? I don't know. We had 60 some going over. Maybe we lost 20. But we got across. And when we got across, we ran into the uh, Regina Rifles, who'd gone ahead on our left. And the Canadian Scottish were on our right, and we were in the middle. So we ran into the Regina Rifles on our left. And uh, I said, uh, <clears throat> oh, what kind of a do is this? And they said, it's shaky as hell, and uh, we don't know if we can hold it. We dug in and uh, occupied these uh, trenches that the Germans had. And the Germans uh, put in about three attacks between four and first light, I guess. The next day was quiet. We were sort of regrouping and whatnot. That would be the seventh. On the eighth, we needed reinforcements. I, a company, uh, an infantry company is about 120. I was down to about 30 men. So I couldn't hold the ground. They sent up some conscripts to us. Good guys, want to fight? No choice, but wanted to fight. Uh, most of them French speaking, and I could speak a little French, so we were all right there. So <clears throat> they came up the next day. That would be the ninth, was we got reinforced. Then um, we went over the afternoon of the ninth and occupied these more of these slip trenches filled them up with new troops, and um, had a fairly quiet night. The 10th, the colonel called me and he said, I want you to put an attack on this Graf Jan. I said, OK, fine. So I got a hold of three or four of my best men. I said, no, we'll go down this road as far as we can and dig in. That's the first step. Then after we dug in and we get a good look at the ground, and Sergeant Magici will be with us, and Magici will say, OK, bring up the rest of your men. In the meantime, I stayed in the slit trench behind where I could organize the troops who were coming up. So Magici went up the road, and uh, then I got a signal from him, come ahead. So I brought up about 10 or 15 reinforcements. It was a, a road with polder land on each side flooded, so you could only get so many men up. I got up there, and as soon as we got in, they fired every damn thing at us you could think of. Mortars, uh, little two-inch mortars, what we call Popeyes, uh, machine guns, uh, submachine guns, everything you could think of was just hell. So um, I said to McGeechee, well, there's no point in staying here. We're just going to get killed. So Mugichi turned around and he said to me, uh, you're getting out first. I said, why? He said, because I want you to organize everybody when they come back. Otherwise, they'll just come back to where you started and it'll be a kind of a milling around and everybody's going to get killed. So he said, I'm sending you, he is the sergeant. I'm the officer. He said, I'm sending you back first. So I started back down the canal and I got hit. I felt this guy grab me by the back it was Magici, and he said to me, uh, can you walk? I said, I don't know, I think I can. He said, okay, I'm gonna put you in a slit trench. So he took me back and put me in the slit trench, and I blanked out, and then I saw a German up above me, he dropped a grenade on me, and uh, that's all I remembered. Then I lay there, and I was all covered with mud, and they were digging me out, and uh, they, uh, by that time, the, we had a K-Pak bridge across, but it had been blown by the Germans. So uh, Alec Bell came along, who was one of my big sergeants, big tough guy. And uh, Alec came along and he said, are you all right, sir? And I said, I don't know. I said, uh, the pain's gone. He said, no wonder, it's all full of mud. They were packing mud over my feet so I wouldn't feel the pain, you see. And he said, we're going to get you the hell out of here. And the next thing I saw was, Alex saying, um, just like, uh, like shooting ducks in the marshes, he said, I got a punt. He threw me in this punt and it, I thought it was full of water. And one guy in the front with a pole and another guy with a rifle in the back. 
And I put my hand down in this thing, and I lifted it up, and it was all blood. And I said, my God, it's all blood. I was <laughs> bleeding like a stuck pig. And I thought, oh, I guess this is it. I don't know. But um, Bell said, no, we're going to get you out of here. Don't, don't worry about it. So they carried me out, and I got back to the RAP, the Red General Aid Post. And the um, doc came along, and he said, um, well, I'm going to give you a shot of morphine, but the only clean place I've got is between your neckline. So he gave me a shot of morphine in here, and I, I blessed him for that. And then he turned to, uh, to his uh, assistant, and he said, that's, uh, that's chattered. And, and he said, uh, don't let him suffer. I thought, I know what that means. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and anyhow, uh, they, they got me out of there, and I don't remember uh, getting back to the first port of call is the uh, casualty clearing station. But uh, I remember them saying, well, it, he's lost a foot. And uh, then they got me back to 12 uh, General Field Hospital. And I was lying there, and a, a doctor came along. I believe his name was Hunter. And he came along, and he said, you're the last one I can operate on today. And he said, you know what time it is? I said, no. He said, it's midnight. So I'd been from 2 o'clock till midnight. So he took me in at midnight and uh, took off the part of one leg and said, I think we can save your other leg, but I'm not sure. The next thing I remember, I was uh, in a great big uh, drill hall, being put in a stretcher and being flown back to England. I guess the next few days, I, I must have changed hospitals. They said, you, have, you need more surgery. And I had a bullet wound in the gut, so that, that was very serious. And finally got that out. In retrospect, looking back on it, it should have helped me, but I asked, first thing I asked for was Jimmy Kerr. I said, what happened to Jimmy Kerr? Because he told me the night before. He says, tomorrow I get it. I said, ah, you're full of it. He said, no, tomorrow I get it. So I, when I asked for Jimmy Kerr, they said, he's in the, you, you, you sent McGeechee to get him. I said, I did. He said, yeah, he was dead. Jimmy Kerr served with him right from the start. There, but for the grace of God, it would be me. And my, my dad taught me a bit of a dog roll one time. It's called Why Me? And the answer is, is Why Me? Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> And I kept saying this over and over and over again. And I finally said, well, it was Jim Stern. Maybe I'm next week, but what the hell? And I realized I can, for the first time that there would be no more week, next week. The war was over for me. And uh, I, I, I must say to you, in all honesty, that was a feeling of great relief to realize that my war was over, but not Thank God I didn't get it on D-Day or I didn't get it and you know, I had my four months in and that was fine. With regard to Leopold Canal, it's happiness. It's happiness. I was glad to sacrifice a leg knowing I was going to get out of this war. Now that may be very... Um, well, I say that may be very selfish on me, on my part, I don't know. But, I mean, that's why I, the Leopold Canal always brings flooding back of, of, of nice thoughts. And when I sometimes go to bed at night and I can't sleep, I think of the Leopold Canal. And I think of everything that happened, and I think of McGeechee, what a bloody hero he was, and Jimmy Kerr and whatnot. But I also think that that was the battle that that I went through that allowed me to continue living. Whereas now with Soulangy, I was not wounded at Soulangy. But in Soulangy, uh, it was a terrible battle because my plan had gone awry. That's really what bothers me, to be honest with you. It was that I, whether it was a good plan or a bad plan, I don't know. 
But I know that, and I've talked to the Colonel about this, Colonel Fulton about this. He's now dead, but he, he thinks it was a good plan. And, but he may have been saying that to make me feel good. But it was my plan, and, and I lost uh, three, I lost more than three, but I lost three really great guys in that battle. So um, maybe that's why it's worse than, than Leopold, because you balance it out. You see, the Leopold is, is where I got saved. Tough, it's tough. Even, you know, do you ever get over it? Three nights ago, I dreamt about it again. Three nights ago, for God's sake. <laughs> do I ever get over it? Do I want to get over it? I don't know. Are these thoughts bad for you? These uh, dreams, if you like, or recreations in your mind, are they bad for you? And I don't know the answer to that. I really don't know the answer to that. I, I wrestled with it a bit later on in my book, but I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, and secondly, if they are bad for me, can I do anything about them? Because I've reached the age in life when, um, when I don't sleep well. I sleep, but I don't sleep well, and I know that. I'll get up in the night and go and make myself a cup of tea, and. Uh, then I realize I'm thinking about this damn battle. So, so much for, for, for memories 60 years later. Guys who are through it, I think it's their, it's their one sustaining memory. And I, what does it sustain? Well, maybe it sustains the fact that it's, they're proud of what they did or they're not proud of what they did. It could be one or the other, who knows? It's a tougher question uh, for me because I can't answer it, you see? I divided my, uh, my body into parts. I don't need my legs, really. I need my head, and the head was okay. So with the head, I could go out and challenge the world and find something to do that would be useful. It gave me an opportunity that I never would have had otherwise. I mean, my God, I mean, look at the opportunities I've had. I never would have had those opportunities had it not been for the war, had it not been for the, for getting cracked up a bit in the war and, you know, taking a hit when I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, it was worthwhile. I, I, I would say that it, it all hasn't been a picnic, but I've always had a way of finding where the, uh, where the good, the good part of it was, and say, hold, hold on to that. I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing because I would be afraid that the next, uh, when they dealt the card next time, I wouldn't get all the good cards. I'd get a bunch of twos or something. <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, I think that uh, you, you you play with the cards you've got, and you make the best you can, and somewhere in that deck was a, a work ethic that I'm happy about, and, and um, wonderful opportunity to build something, so what, what more does the guy want? They shall grow not old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.
We saw them win and lose with pride We sat and watched and were amazed They gave us hope, we gave them praise are our 